Morbidology is a weekly true crime podcast hosted by me, Emily G. Thompson, author of Unsolved Child Murders and co-author of Unsolved Murders, True Crime Cases Uncovered. 911 emergency. My son shot my husband. I need an ambulance. He's bleeding. Using audio from 911 calls, interrogations, trial testimony and interviews, Morbidology takes a look at some of the most mysterious and disturbing crimes from all across the world. You know why you're here? For a uh, home invasion gone terribly wrong. From shocking murders to missing children, we focus on a variety of cases and put you, the listener, right into the middle of the investigation. Listen to Morbidology now on iTunes, Spreaker, Stitcher, Podbean and wherever else you get your podcasts. I'm JDC053, a confused clone without any pants. Um, uh, I'm James Not a Cop, who is definitely not a cop. I'm Tobias Clutterbuck, a terrible Victorian actor. I'm Action 6 news reporter Chet Cleveland. And I'm star of the stage Helen Slaymaker. And I'm Lieutenant Starburst Cheese It Taco Bell Esquire, the third. And this is Rolling Misadventures, a podcast that's part tabletop real play, part improvised audio drama. And a complete and total fiasco. Join us every two weeks for stories of mayhem, murder, and occasionally a moose. So check out Rolling Misadventures and see how it all goes wrong at rollingmisadventures.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Dick beans. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this podcast, truly one of the most unusual ever recorded, contains dribble, slang, and frank discussion of subject matter which under no circumstances should be heard by small children, persons with a heart condition, or anyone who is upset easily. If you are such a person, or if you are the parent of a very small child in the room, we urge you to switch off your streaming device now. Hey, hey, Jen. Hey, Cam, how are you? I am delightful. What's going on? Not much, just doing this audio again over and over and over. <laughs> Here's the beauty. And this one goes out to Dick Vane because uh, I commented on a status and then we chatted about it. And yeah, this is right. So you got to pretend we've done this episode already. We recorded it, right? Mm-hmm. But Jennifer's going to fake it and pretend like she doesn't know what it's about. Because I'm going to be surprised. To do it all over again. Mm-hmm. Even though it's I. Surprise! I, surprise! So I'm going to wow. say, oh my God. You are kidding me. Yeah. Um, didn't we get a bad review once that said that the acting was terrible, that you didn't know what the other person, or you, you pretended that you didn't know what the other person was saying or doing, and we're like, um, no, usually. We like really don't we know. Episodes, we're just, yeah. Well, we're bad That actresses. is the way it goes. Whatever. All right, that should so, have been the name of our podcast. Whatever. whatever. I know. It should have. Whatever. That's what my husband suggested, but, you know. Whatever, whatever. you know. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Whatever, you know. Uh-huh. All right, Jen, you ready to get going? Yep. Do it. Let's go. Surprise me with this video, with this uh, new episode, Camille. I've never heard it's the almost, story of Jessica it, before. Oh, wait, wait. Is that who we're doing? Oh, mm. I, it's like you're psychic. Remember? I know. Laura I know. Power said you had a touch of the psychic I am. Maybe that's I've, it. I'm touched in the head. You're touched. Yeah. Mm. All right. Here we go. Today's case takes us to Shepherdsville, Kentucky, and that's located on the Salt River in Mm -hmm. Bullitt County, Kentucky. Now, Bullitt County, that area is located just south of Louisville, if you guys know where that is. Louisville. Population is around 11,000, give or take. That that was taken during the 2010 U.S. Census. So not really a big town, not a teeny town, but not really large. Now, when I went to look up Shepherdsville, or Shepherdsville, Uh, .net. I wanted to find out about the town. I just Mm kind of giggled to myself and I thought you might find it funny as well. Surprise Um, me with it. I know. It's like you've never heard of (laughs) it. On the homepage, it said, don't forget, property taxes are due soon. 
mm-hmm. and it was just like a giant note. It just cracked me up. That's like, you know, I don't know. It's very personal, I guess. You yeah. know what I mean? Small town America. 11,000 is really not that small. So no, that's what I said. It's not I mean, tiny, it's, but it's, it's it's bigger than what we grew up in. So it is. So mm-hmm. it's, I mean, not tiny, but not huge. Yeah. The area is made up mostly of farmers, and a lot of these farmers have taken over the land from their father who worked it, from their father who worked it, continuing on and on. So generations Mm -hmm. of farmers. Nothing really big or terrible ever happens, and, you know, they kind of like it that way. Of course, we all do. So on Friday, September 10th, 1999, no one was too concerned about a missing teen girl at first. Now, that would end up being the first of many mistakes that were made, but we'll get to that in a minute. It's a typical Friday when the Dish and family is getting ready for the day. Mother Edna is up early, 5.30 a.m., getting ready for work, while Dad, Mike, gets up shortly after to get ready as well and wake up the two younger boys so they wouldn't miss the bus. Edna leaves for work first and is followed shortly thereafter by Mike. The boys, Christopher and Michael, would catch the bus to Bernheim Middle School. Mike would leave for work next, shortly after, with their 17-year-old daughter, Jessica, following behind, leaving for Bullet High School, which I think is kind of a cool name for a high school. Bullet High School? And this would be... Not really. Yeah. No, no, I just think it... I just think not bullet like gun, but like bullet. And it's not... It's spelled different, too. Mm, Okay. Bullet, like Steve McQueen bullet. Jessica would leave at about 7.15 in the morning. She had her cute little red Pontiac that she was so proud of because she had bought that with her very own money that she had earned from her part-time job at Hardy's Restaurant. Aww. <laughs> we had a Hardy's. That was like our big first major restaurant in our chain. It was. Yeah. It's just another school day, work day, whatever in the house. Edna returns home from work around 1 p.m. and she goes inside the home. Jessica is no longer in bed, as it's empty, obviously, thinking she went. But she's surprised because, you know, Jessica's car was left out in front. So she yells for her daughter, thinking maybe Jessica was sick, ended up getting sick, or came home early. But Jessica doesn't respond. Edna thinks that maybe Mike took Jessica to school that day. So she calls him, and he says, uh, no, I didn't do that. But, you know, maybe it broke down. Maybe somebody gave her a ride to school. You have an extra set of keys. Go out and try to start the car. Edna goes outside, she opens Jessica's car door, and a sick feeling immediately hits her. She finds Jessica's purse inside with her cell phone sticking out of it. On the floorboard of the driver's side of the car is one of Jessica's shoes. Now, Mm. 1999, you know, kids, especially girls, they don't go anywhere without a cell phone, their purse, all all their nice stuff, right? You don't go anywhere without shoes, much less with one shoe. I would automatically vomit. It would just like you just you know something's wrong. Something's wrong. And it wasn't just like it was lying there and maybe another shoe was missing. Like it, she just taken off her shoe and one's in the back seat and one's in the front seat. It it looked like Like, it had been. Yes, she was wearing it and it fell off. Right. Yes, exactly. Edna picks up the cell phone and she knows right now that something is definitely wrong. Jessica had dialed nine and one, but not the last one. So she was, she, she was in the middle of something. Right. Exactly. Yes. With Edna still outside, Mike pulls into the driveway and Edna tells Mike that something really bad's happened. Edna calls school and the school does confirm to Edna that Jessica never made it to school that day. So Mike, Edna, they start calling Jessica's friends, talking to neighbors. They're trying to get some information before, you know, maybe they just missed something. Maybe Jessica had plans and they missed that. Right. So they're kind of trying to see where she could be. It's now about 5 o'clock. Mike and Edna know that they have to do something. So they go to the sheriff's office. They decide they're going to go in and talk to the sheriff, see what they can do, see what they can find out. The sheriff suggests that perhaps, you know, Jessica just took off for a bit. She'll be back. Mike, her father, is fast to point out that not only is Jessica not the type of person to run away, there is no way that she would take off with just one shoe on. There's no way. No. Police tell them, this is, I mean, there's so many mistakes in this. Police tell them to just go home, relax, and if Jessica's not back in the morning, go ahead and come on back to the station. Say what? I don't think so, pal. No way. Deputy David Greenwell was sent to the Dishon home the next morning when Mike and Edna had called and said, guess what? She didn't come back. Mm -hmm. He realizes that the scene wasn't right. Something was wrong. So he calls Detective Charles Mann. Not once, but twice, asking for some assistance. 
Mm-hmm. And this came out l- later in court testimony. Both times, the senior officer, senior detective, refused to go, saying, you know, the teen's just a runaway. She'll be back. No, no, they're not runaways. As a parent, yeah, you know no. your child. If they've never oh, run totally. away before, if they've never been in trouble before, and the parents say, you know what, she's missing, believe the damn parents. I don't understand why. Especially in a, in a small little area like right. that, you know, that cannot be an everyday occurrence that, that parents come into the station upset about their kid missing, right? It can't be, but uh, are they lazy? Do they just not want to look at one? Do they just feel that it's a waste of time that, I don't know, I don't know. drives me nuts? So if this were a big city, as we just said, mm-hmm. authorities would have most likely swarmed in and took over. But it's a small community in Kentucky where, like I said, lots of family were there. They lived there. They've died there. It's just kind of remote. So as we'd learn, this would be yet another mistake that they would make in this investigation. But, mm-hmm. you know, what we say about hindsight, Jen, 2020. Mm-hmm. And stop it. They don't run away. And it's never a mannequin. Mm-hmm. True. It's now the next day, September 11th, and Jessica has now been gone for 24 hours. And the Deshaun parents head back to the police station because they want to know what are the authorities going to do to help them out. They are, you know, screaming mad, obviously. They want somebody put on the case. Mm -hmm. And uh, the police inform them, you know what, you just go ahead and run home. We'll send somebody over right away. Oh, yeah. What? They would hate to see me walk through their door. They wouldn't want to mess with me, I'm telling you. Thank you. The Deshaun's go back home. You know, they're kind of preparing in their head for like an onslaught of investigators, detectives, Mm -hmm. authority figures to come and investigate. And instead, two guys come out in a car, (laughs) two guys in a patrol car. That's it. The two guys investigate Jessica's car and they do so without gloves. They look through everything. They didn't see anything that seemed off right away. I mean, except for, you know, one shoe. After they looked through the whole car with no gloves, might I add, did I mention they didn't have gloves? Hey, did they, they get, wear did they wear gloves? They did not wear gloves, Jen. Oh, good. They did not. And they touched everything. They touched the steering oh. wheel. They touched the car door. They touched everything. Touch, 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 right? So I see they're following police protocol, right? Exactly. Yeah, good. Egg. Exactly. Yay. So when they were done looking through the car, the two officers get back into the squad car and they head back to the station. I just, you know, there has to be some general basic police procedures and even in 1999 it come on they you know, should know on. better mm-hmm. september 12th rolls around it's now been 48 hours since jessica has been missing mike makes a plea through the news community to please help find his daughter he's tearful he's i'm sure he's pulling out his hair i would be like are you kidding me this cannot be happening mm-hmm. the community comes together and they arrange a small search party to help look for jessica The area up there is pretty remote, a little dense. It is an area called the Salt River Bottoms, and I guess it's pretty kind of known as a dumping ground for the area. You've got a mattress that won't be picked up by the garbage men. Mm -hmm. We got the Salt River Bottom for you, right? So you just go dump everything out there. We did. Ours was by Lover's Leap, remember? I don't break the law. I mean, I do, but I didn't do that. Oh, no, you didn't go dump things. You could, when you would drive out to Lover's Leap, you would see like towards like the left of the road it was always people discarded yeah they would discard ovens and stoves and mattresses and refrigerators yeah that's so bothersome you know that stuff doesn't go away Mm -mm. nope just leave it for somebody else because it's so much easier to have somebody else clean up than clean it up yourself exactly Mm -hmm. family and friends come together they're going to help mike and edna look for their baby girl mike's brother whose name is stanley just mentions to mike that you know Really, if you wanted to hide a body, you would ditch it in the river bottoms, right? right? Mm -hmm. Which are the salt river bottoms, which I mentioned before. The family and friends venture out to the area. Emotions are on overload, knowing that they may at any time stumble upon the body of this young girl. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that has to be just, I don't even know. I don't don't even know know if I could do that. That's terrible. I don't, I think I could look for another. As a parent? I could look for another child possibly, but for... Anyone that your own, uh, I know, yeah, I don't, I don't think I could. I couldn't either. I would want to, and I would do everything else. I don't think I could go for fear that I would see them that way. Because once you see them in mm-hmm. a horrible mm-hmm. way, that's how you will see them forever. And I just couldn't Stuck do that. Stuck in your head. Mm-hmm. Horrible. It, All right. Speaking of overwhelming, it was so overwhelming, in fact, that Stanley, Mike's brother, actually started to get physically sick and he needed to be taken home. It was just too much, I guess, for him to envision, you know, running into his niece's body out there. It's horrible. 
They didn't find Jessica, and finally they gave up the search for the day. That evening, the entire family was so exhausted, mentally and physically, gotcha. that they were kind of, you know, just shutting down for the evening. When all of a sudden, Jessica's younger brother, named Chris, runs in the house, and he says to his father that he was outside and he heard screaming. Oh. He swore it was a female, sounded like Jessica, and they were screaming for help me. <sighs> Mike goes into overdrive, runs to the bedroom, gets his shotgun, and he goes outside unsure of what he's going to find. He and Chris are going to go and kind of look around, see if they can find anything. As they are leaving the property... Mike's brother, Stanley, drives in, and he tells them that, you know what, he's going to venture out with them. He's mm. going to go with them to look to see what they can find. As they're looking around, they notice a person on the nearby land, and it looks like they're burning something. And as they get closer, they can see it's somebody burning clothes in a big barrel. Oh. You know, since we started doing these stories, I never realized so many people have burned barrels. Yeah. I, I really didn't. I, I guess it's a thing, huh? I know it was a thing. Like, when we... We're growing up. My grandmother always had a burn barrel that she would burn, like, uh, burnable trash instead of Just throwing like it away. Paper products and stuff? Paper products and, you know. Food? I don't know I about food. food. Like compost? I don't know. But, like, I remember I found uh, some old dolls that were my aunt's in the burn barrel. And so I took them out of the burn barrel because I wanted them for myself. You know, so she would just burn stuff. Because, you know, burning plastic is always healthy. I was just, my eyes are crossed. I'm like, what? Yeah. And then I was like, is it a material doll? That's terrible. No, okay, so they no, just no, burned no. Anything. Was, I still have them to this day. But yeah, she would just Aww. burn stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh, she liked fire. You know I about that. Know. As they get closer, they can see who is burning clothes in this burning barrel. And it is a man by the name of David Bucky Brooks. He goes by Bucky Brooks. Mm-hmm. The Brooks property and the addition property actually bump up against each other. And, you know, there's really no love lost between the two families. They didn't really like each other too much. Mm -hmm. In fact, Bucky Brooks had placed a few phone calls after Jessica went missing to the Dishon family saying, you know, don't kill him. Please. Just weird hangups, things like that. Ew. It's just, yeah, it's just weird. So the Brooks family also were the only family in that area that refused to have their property searched. Yeah, that's not a Nothing good sign. Nothing says suspension. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? Police come out to the Brooks residence, and they bring search dogs, and the search dogs, looking around, they search everything in the barn, the garage, every piece of land out there. Police ask the Dishon family for a description of what Jessica was wearing the day she went missing. She had some, like, hot pink shorts mm -hmm. on, and so that's what they were looking and for. And she right? had one shoe. She's she the missing teen that has one shoe on. Can't miss her. Can't and miss her. cute as a button. Officers make their way to the burn barrel, and immediately one of the dogs hit on a scent. Inside, they locate two gloves that have decomposing body scent on them. And uh, at this time, because of, I guess, they didn't have enough, no one at the Brooks homestead was arrested because, you know, they said that we just don't have enough. So they had to leave the police. Yeah, but... I know. I know, I know what you're saying. But I, dog, you think. I know, but d smell or these search dogs are trained to just hit on decomposing human bodies. I believe okay. all different. That's, yeah, I, I, whatever. I think this is mistake number five. If we're counting, you know. Oh, like, we're not counting oops, because up. our math skills aren't don't go that high. So I'm gonna say it's four or five, something like that. I don't know, but yes, you are correct. Mm -hmm. Which takes me to the next point. The additions are furious. I mean, wouldn't you be? Oh. Guys, we just kind of were. I am. Yeah. The family calls the FBI and they're begging them to step in and help. They need help desperately. This little small town is not quite cutting it, right? Mm -mm. The FBI come in and they took Jessica's car along with some items from her bedroom. The FBI brought a helicopter in to search over the area. They even walked through a pond. And it was kind of like waist deep. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking, because every time I like read this stuff or see it, I, th I put myself there. I don't, I don't, you know what I'm saying. I'm sure you do. Too. Oh, I'm yeah. sure everybody does. But I was thinking like there was guys, you know, officers hand in hand going across the pond. And I'm thinking what, oh, like stumbling upon a body. Just mm -hmm. that's not, that's just so far from my thought, you know, like that's not okay. Mm -mm. Right. Mm -mm. Like no. you're walking a pond to make sure that the body's not in there. Mm -hmm. No, I get you. The FBI also goes in and they search the Brooks farm yet again, and this time they find something. Inside the barn was a bent up 
kind of a damaged photo of Jessica. Hmm, okay. Bucky Brooks and his brother, who goes by Tommy Brooks, are now looking more and more like they were involved in the disappearance of Jessica. Or at least they know something, right? Right. Because Bucky's not anywhere close in age to Jessica, correct? Mm -mm. So there's no, yeah, he's married even. Yeah, there's no mm -hmm. he a grown man should not have a picture of a teen that he in does your, not in know. your barn. Yeah, like that. That's weird. Mm -hmm. mm, this is weird. September 27th. It's now been 17 days since Jessica went missing when a bus driver whose name is Karen was cutting through the river bottoms to save some time. And she noticed something kind of weird over, you know, kind of over across over there yonder the land. Over there yonder. There you Over go. Over there yonder in the um, got, uh, salt bottom plains. That sounds like a song. That's right. It? Over there yonder <laughs> in the salt the, the salt bottom plains. Salt bottom trains. Oh, salt oh. bottom plains. That sounds like a Oh Brother Where Out mm -hmm. That song. Okay. It looked like it was a person propped up against a tree. Now, of course, she's thinking, no way mm -mm. could that be. That That's just unreal. So she gets a little bit closer, and it, it's no mistaking that it is in fact, a person. So mm. she races back to her car. She calls police. I could not imagine how much therapy I need if I would ever have to come across a body. Plus, in a small town like this, mm. even if you didn't know them, you've seen pictures of them, the people missing. Yeah. So you're automatically going to be like, I oh, just, my God, that's I it. Couldn't, mm -mm. No. The FBI forensic team is sent out. The body that they discovered was so severely decomposed mm. with many body parts missing. And at this time, they weren't sure if the body parts were missing due to, you know, maybe scavengers coming by or if there was some sort of torture. At this Animals, point, they weren't yeah. sure. What was clear is that the body was so badly damaged that they weren't positive that they had found, but they were pretty darn sure. And that was that this was Jessica right. Dishon. And I'm guessing by clothes, maybe, and now how, her hair. And how long was she missing from when they found the body? 17 days. 17 days. 17 yeah, days. That's a that's a long time. To be outside. Yeah. Yeah. Police asked for somebody in the family to come identify the body, and Edna said she would um, no. because Mike said he just couldn't do that. I think as a mother, we bring him in this world, so you'd want to check on that. That's the last thing you will ever, that's the last time you will it ever is. see them, and you just don't mm -hmm. want that started. You don't want to see him like that, mm -mm. but at the same time, it's like, that's your baby, that's your That's child. your closure. You know I mean? That's I, why we have the open casket, so it can <sighs> like dawn on you that they're gone and it, that's really who is i don't know i don't know and i hope we never, never have, have to, to no i just i hope i hope so authorities determined that jessica's cause of death was due to strangulation jessica also had a broken jaw and they did determine that a few of her fingers had actually been cut off Ugh. so they weren't scavenged by animals she was tortured they determined that 17-year-old Jessica was not killed the day she went missing, but kept alive for what they determined is about three days. Mm. I don't even have words for that. And in terror I, the whole mm. time. Yeah, no. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The community is outraged and scared. How did this happen? That's what I want to know. Police go straight to Bucky Brooks. They want some answers. They need some answers. Mm -hmm. Those answers, of course, would only lead to more questions. His story can't stay the same. He's changing it. Police offer. They want to do a polygraph test. They offer him a polygraph test. He consents. He does it. And he fails miserably. Uh. At this point, investigators are pretty sure that Tommy Brooks, which is his brother, and Bucky Brooks definitely had something to do oh, yeah. with the murder of Jessica. It's all over but the shouting. All they have to do is get a slam dunk and go to trial, right? Thank you. And that brings me to my next point. Sometimes your segues are just, it's almost like you've heard it before. That's mm -hmm. what I was just going to say. January 18th, 2001, David Bucky Brooks and Joseph Tommy Brooks, who names their kids at least, are arrested in connection to Jessica Edition's death. David Brooks is arrested and charged with murder, kidnapping, and tampering with physical evidence and complicity. Joseph, a.k.a. Tommy, Brooks is charged with tampering with physical evidence and complicity. A grand jury indictment is brought against the Brooks brothers. They go to court and then are indicted with first-degree murder, and if they are found guilty, they will face the death penalty. The day the trial starts, all the media was there. The room is filled up, which I imagine would be the case. Just as the investigation started out badly, oh, it continues. Just wait till you hear this, Jen. For example, after finding Jessica's body, what is normally done 
after the autopsy is uh, parts of the body. And I learned this today, for instance, not even with this case. I was on, on a podcast. They take body parts and they save them and they freeze them in case they uh, have to determine things later. For instance, here's what I learned today, that if you die from alcohol poisoning, so mm -hmm. if you die from alcohol overdose, I guess, your lungs become enlarged because they suck in that extra alcohol. Mm. I had mm -hmm. no idea. Mm -hmm. So that, that they weigh your lungs to help yeah. determine if that wasn't in fact the case. And your heart. Who knew? And your heart and your liver and your brain. Yeah. Every, the more you know. Everything is weighed. All of that I could get, but I, the lungs, because it's breath, oxygen, and you don't really have water there necessarily, you know what I mean? Well, or liquid, I guess. Some do. I don't know. I, I just found that interesting. Yeah, some do. The ones that OD'd uh, courtesy of alcohol. Mm -hmm. The body parts of Jessica were supposed to be taken in stored in coolers and kept frozen, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they weren't. They just, they were put in a cooler, they were marked, and then they were set aside. They literally rotted inside the cooler. That is so I'm, unprofessional. Seriously. I mean, it's... You're speechless. Yeah, Thank no. I, that's I, what I said. That's gross negligence. I can't believe that that would even mm -hmm. happen. Mm -hmm. I, Only gets worse from there, Jen. Oh, I, oh, right? I know. Oh, I know how the, bad it gets. The defense, it's like you've heard it before. I know. The defense tried to say that their whole game plan was to blame it on another guy. And the idea was that he had sold drugs to Jessica. He was, in fact, her drug mm -hmm. dealer. However, he did take the stand. He did say, yes, you know, I, I may have given her a little marijuana here and there. I did not in any way kill her. It's obvious that the defense is kind of, you know, trying to pin this on him. Right. And he's like, mm, nope. You know, a little drug dealer. From Podunk, USA does not make a killer, right? No, not necessarily. No. Sometimes, sometimes, but not always. It gets even worse. So they bring up the detective, one of those detectives that did such a not good job investigating from the get go. They bring him up, they put him on the stand, and, you know, they're nailing him with questions as, as they do. And he kept saying, you know, Bucky Brooks is responsible for this. He did it. I'm positive he did it. And he kept saying this and, you know, he wouldn't really give any reasons. And then finally, he kind of snapped. He failed the polygraph, and that proves he did it. He did it, meaning Bucky, right? right? Mm -hmm. Well, we all know the polygraph is not admissible in court, and it's purely to attempt. I mean, it's, it's a tactic used to try to put pressure on somebody and get a confession. You, in no way, can use it in a trial, right? right? Mm -hmm. You just can't do that. January 29th, 2003, a bullet circuit judge declares a mistrial in David Brooks and Tommy Brooks' case after the sheriff said that on the stand. Is that terrible? Yeah, no, it is. Terrible. So they're, they're kind of struggling. Years go by. You know, this was the end of 2003. They know that the only way that he could ever stand trial, the Brooks brothers could ever stand trial again, would be up to the state. And the state opts to do nothing. They decide to dismiss the charges against both of the Brooks brothers. They would not stand trial for the kidnapping and murder of Jessica Edition. The case goes cold. Jessica's family suffering. The stress, it would have to be incredible. In fact, Edna and Mike end up divorcing. And I don't think you could keep a marriage together. There's just, I just don't think you could. Right. I think that's too much to bear. Fast forward, June 2013. Bullitt County decides they need to bring somebody in. They need somebody that can come in, fresh eyes, take a look at this. They decide to hire Detective Lynn Hunt to come in and take a look at all this stuff. So she goes and she starts looking through all the material that they have. She's kind of in shock. She can't believe how badly this was, I guess, what do you want to say, investigated? Investigated? Oh, you think it, you think it was? Mm-hmm. I do. Mm-hmm. So, for instance, she goes in, she pulls out some boxes, right? Now, Lynn Hunt, she's no dummy. She had been in law enforcement for 25 years. She's got a vast knowledge of forensic process, processes, process, I don't know, whatever it takes to get a case solved. And just like many detectives who, you know, they're like a dog with a bone. Mm -hmm. Once they get something, they're going to stay on it, right? A good ones do. So The other ones don't use gloves. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. She was also a former officer with the Louisville. Metro Police. Level? She had worked, mm -hmm. uh, wor worked her way up to the commander of the Sex Crimes Unit and Elderly Abuse Department before being asked to reorganize the forensic side of the cold case unit. So that's what she did. And upon doing this, the first case she wants to get her little hands on 
is Jessica's right. case, okay? I, I agree. I think that's awesome. So she goes in, she opens the box. Like I said, there wasn't much to go on, but it was even more than that. Officers didn't take good notes. Not formal at all. They would write down like Jennifer with like a number mm-hmm. or if they even had that. There wasn't any formal names, numbers, addresses. A lot of the notes were scribbled on napkins, scraps of paper. I mean, yeah. it was just a, a hodgepodge. I was going to say that's exactly how we'd end up investigating. Oh, it would be. I, that's kind of how I do it. Mm-hmm. But but I know my chaos, but you can't do that if you're a police officer mm-hmm. and not, you know. But remember when in the missing Misty Murray episode, mm-hmm. the police mm-hmm. did the exact same thing. They went on a huge ship and talked to people and they just used their first name, like a ship with the workers that don't always work on that ship mm-hmm. it was a revolving yeah. crew and it was like crazy, right? yeah talk to pete he said talk to phil talk to phil nothing yeah i mean it just it's ridiculous just it's crazy right it's almost like they didn't think she was really abducted they thought she ran away or and they were just going or through they the thought motions. That she, yeah yeah exactly they thought that it would be solved sooner than later so it wasn't really that important to keep good notes right mm-hmm. boy were they wrong exactly Detective Hunt heads over to the Dishon house, okay? Mm-hmm. So she's going to go meet with the family. She's going to tell them that she's going to be working on Jessica's case. She meets with Mike and Jessica's younger brother, Bubby. Bubby. I love this. It's really Michael and Chris. Bubby. Father Mike is so thrilled. He is ecstatic to have that case back open. Mm-hmm. He just needs help, right? Mm-hmm. Hunt makes her way back to Jessica's room to look around and try to get to know Jessica. Bubby goes to her closet and gives Lynn Hunt a box. And this struck me as odd, too. Inside the box is one shoe, the shoe that was found in the car, along with her cell phone and some other mementos that were found in the car that day. Mm. She goes ahead and loads all that stuff up into her car. She's going to take it with her. Now, this is where I want to know, why was that stuff not taken into custody and kept? Mm -hmm. Because isn't that how it works? Like, you take it into custody. Should the case be solved or it come to a conclusion all the, that property is given back to the family, right? Yeah, it's evidence. You don't Every single it. bit is evidence, okay. and it should be recorded and put in a box and stored in the evidence room. The parents should not get any of that back. Sadly, but you're right. We should be detectives, Jen. Well, at least be there and mother all these detectives and telling them what they're doing wrong. I mean, we do that really well with our <laughs> kids. What you should do <laughs> is this. Uh, that's funny. Lynn Hunt's getting really comfortable in this. She's trying, you know, she's trying her best. She is just taking names and taking numbers and doing what she can. She contacts the defense attorney's office and she requests all the case files from that trial of the Brooks brothers. Please tell me they at least have she that. Down. Right? Yeah, right. She hunkers down. She knows she's got a lot of info to get through. And she really hopes in the end she's going to nail the person that did this to Jessica. It wasn't too long before she stumbles upon something, and it was a little bit of new information about Bucky Brooks. Mm -hmm. Hidden deep within those files was a mental evaluation of Bucky Brooks. It seems that Bucky Brooks, his IQ was listed at 61, which means he should have never, never been able to take a polygraph exam due to his low IQ. I know. He had no idea how to answer the questions. He couldn't understand them. What they were asking, much less how to answer it. Exactly. That's decently. That's why you should feel happy that you will never be asked to take a polygraph, Cam. Thanks, You're Jen. welcome. Thanks. And you'll be right there mm-hmm. with me as my defense attorney. I will. Boy, that would be a shit show. And oh, a you have no idea how bad that would oh, be. Oh, I do. <laughs> Believe me, I do. It doesn't matter. We'd never make it that far anyway. <clears throat> we couldn't get the uh, cell phones to work no. and the computers to run, so whatever. At this point, Detective Hunt knows that he really probably and most likely did not have anything to do with it. So she kind of just puts him to the side. She's going to start looking at a few of the other people. She takes a look into that drug dealer that took the stand and said, that, yeah, maybe he did, you know, sell her a little drugs, but he in no way killed her. Uh, doesn't take too long to find him. He's actually pretty easy to find. He's in jail. Oh, well, <laughs> surprise, surprise. No way. <laughs> right. Makes finding him and makes him a visit pretty, I guess, what would you, a captive audience. Was you know? he in there yeah, for, have to interview with him. was he in there for selling drugs? I'm not sure. Okay. I'm going to guess yes, but I'm, I, it's been, what, how many years? A lot. It's been several years yeah. since poor Jessica was murdered. 
So she goes in and, you know, she has a little chat with him and he informed her that he was actually staying in a hotel with a lady friend the day that Jessica went missing. And she asked him, could anybody confirm his alibi about staying in the hotel? You know, in other words, did anybody see you? Can someone say, yeah, I ran into him. Yeah, I bought drugs from him, whatever. The guy says the only person he talked to was the maintenance guy that worked at the hotel. Now, Lynn Hunt is like, okay, yeah, there's no way that maintenance guy's going to be working here all these years later. But, you know, you have to, just like any good detective, you got to go, you got to chase every tip down till it comes to nothing. And you got to, so she heads over. And you have to wear your gloves to every crime scene. Even my 13 year old would know to wear gloves. Come on now. Mine probably wouldn't. They're not, they're not that. 14. She's going to be 15. Okay. Sorry. Mine aren't that sneaky. They wouldn't know. Mine is because we watch these TV shows and talk about people about it. Hunt runs over to the hotel and she goes in. She asks the the guy at the the main office, did you work here? Did anybody work here? No, everybody's changed. Everybody's, you know, nobody works here anymore. Okay. So she's leaving. And just by chance, there's a guy out there. Looks like a maintenance guy. Mm -hmm. So she goes over and says, hey, buddy, do you by any chance remember this fella that was staying here a long time ago? It would have been, you know, and she gave him the date. And he says, actually, yes, I do. And he was here all morning. He was with the lady. And I remember that because I remember hearing about it and then seeing it on TV. And I put it all together. And I guess that does make sense. A lot of times out of nowhere, you might not think of anything. But if you small town, Mm -hmm. do you know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Like you're going to see that. And that kind of would stick in your head. But he never told anybody about it. So the drug dealer's out. Right. So the drug dealer is now pretty much in the clear, as well as the Brooks brothers. So she's kind of still wondering and just how sometimes things just fall in your lap. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. A call comes in from a friend that she knows that works in one of the sheriff stations. And um, this information that this person has is courtesy of a prison informant. Mm. And what this informant has to say is going to change everything. It's now 2013. And this informant claims to know something about who killed Jessica Dishon. Detective Hunt goes straight to the Kentucky State Prison. She needs to talk to him, you know, and she's thinking this is not going to be anything. Of course, he knows something. And of course, everybody's innocent, right? Mm -hmm. Hey, and if you can knock off a year, you know, I'm going to tell you stuff. So that, I mean, that's pretty much what she's thinking. We've all heard that over and Mm -hmm. over, right? She meets with this man and he's being housed with other inmates because they had all committed sexual offenses against children. Uh Okay. So he is a sexual predator, if you will. Rapist? Exactly. The informant tells Lynn Hunt that he had been rooming with a man, and that man, you know, in prison, had told him that he was responsible for killing Jessica, but before doing so, he kept her alive for a little bit. He also said the reason he mutilated her was to throw authorities off as he wanted it to seem like maybe it was a drug hit. Now, there were a few things that police kept out of the news, as they always Mm -hmm. do. And the type of mutilation and where it was on her body was one of the things that they kept out of the news. So at this point, she's thinking, no way could this random inmate know this without having been told something Mm -hmm. or, in fact, be involved. He also had a little bit of personal information. The informant says the killer was mad at Jessica because she had begun seeing a boy. She had begun seeing somebody. You know, she's getting up in her teen years. That Mm -hmm. happens. She liked a teen boy and they had begun dating. And, you know, that happens again. He cannot handle it. He couldn't handle Doesn't it. Doesn't want to share. The killer couldn't handle it. He's furious, mm-hmm. right? Jessica had been his, in his mind, for so, so long. The informant goes on to tell Lynn Hunt the man's name. The man's name is Stanley Dishon, <gasps> Jessica's uncle and her dad's brother. No way. Her uncle. No, I know. I know. Horrible. That you're, fa- you're faking it at me because you've already heard this, but seriously. Remember back, it was Stanley who volunteered to go out and search for Jessica soon after she went missing. And this was also Stanley, if you remember, who became violently ill because they were getting really close to the body where he had positioned her. And the thing was, it would later come out, they were less than a mile from her body. And that's why he was kind of like, you know, getting sick. He was scared to death. Wanting to. Yeah. yeah. He was scared to death that they were going to find something on her that he had left and they'd catch him right then and there. Mm Mm-hmm. Terrible. Asshole. It was also Stanley Dishon who tortured young Jessica in that barn near where he dumped her body. This barn was a haven for kids that would get together and drink and party. Mm-hmm. We know right. that because we grew up in a small mm-hmm. town. Near that barn, there's a like a fallen dead tree, I guess, on the ground. And he had actually ditched some of her personal belongings 
near that tree. Now, I can only imagine he did this for several reasons, but one of them was to go back and think about Mm -hmm. it, maybe to have power and control over that. I don't know. Most likely. Knowing that she needs something more solid to make all this work, she heads to the river bottoms to look around. When she's out there, it starts to rain so heavy that it becomes pointless. I mean, they're just getting muddy. They're not everything that they would dig around and try to find. It's just, it's a mess, right? They're not going to find anything on this day. She is with uh, Jessica's little brother, Bubby, that day. So Bubby and her, they decide to pack it up. They're going to drive back to the house. And, you know, as they're driving back, he casually points out a barn. And he mentions that's where all the kids go to party. Yep. Right? So they had heard about the barn. They didn't really see it. Who had heard about the barn? Detective. The police? It, well, they had said that she had been taken somewhere for a couple of days. Remember, oh, And then okay. the barn from Bucky's, but not. I, so there's rumors of the barn or being held somewhere has been gotcha. flying around. Gotcha. Right? Okay. I'm, I'm caught up. I wasn't, I wasn't okay. following okay. where okay. you're going with that. Okay. Detective Hunt goes into the barn. Now, like I said earlier, it's pouring down rain. This is a rundown barn. It's got holes. There's no light. There's, you know, the holes in the ceiling, all that kind of stuff. As she's looking around, she notices a pile of material. She walks over to take a look at it. Suddenly, the pattern of the material looks really familiar. And in fact, it looks so very similar to the bedding Jessica had on her bed at home, Mm -hmm. right? Now, the thing is, is that the Dishon family... Mike, because Edna had ended up moving out after the divorce, never changed a single thing in Jessica's room. They kept it exactly as it was, which I think is a blessing because we're going to find out here in a minute. So they go back. They race back to the house. After they'd scooped up the material, they want to go back to the addition house and compare it, right? Racing into Jessica's room, they toss back her comforter and bam, there's no fitted sheet. It's gone. That fitted sheet was, was in the body. So now they was in the barn, rather, and they know that Jessica was wrapped in that sheet from her room. Wow. It was the fitted sheet or the other sheet? Fitted. That's fitted sheet. That's, the fitted sheet was gone. That's what I would use, too, because the fitted sheet is evil. So here we're going to break it down for you, Jen. Break it down now. Mm-hmm. You ready? Stanley Dishon knew what time Edna left and Mike left for work. He knew what time the boys would follow to get on their bus, and he knew what time Jessica would right. leave. He also knew that Jessica left last Mm -hmm. because he's related to her and I'm sure he's known for years. However, as Jessica was getting ready to leave for school that day, Stanley pulled up. The two argued, this is what the police uh, surmise happened. The two argued and Jessica was getting into her car. Stanley's furious. They're arguing about that boy. They're arguing about everything. Mm -hmm. He yanks her out of the car and in the process, her shoe comes off. It got, you know, kind of caught in the car and it lands on the floorboard on the driver's side. As they're fighting, Jessica was telling Stanley she was going to tell everyone what Stanley had been doing to her since she was a little girl, which was raping and sodomizing her. Mm -hmm. Stanley is freaking out, and he attacks Jessica violently. He punches her in the face and breaks her jaw. Oh, lordy. She passes out. Panic. Full swing now. Stanley knows that if his brother finds out what he's been doing to his sweet daughter, his niece, and doing all of this for years underneath their nose, he knows Mike will kill him. He should have thought about he that panics. a long time ago. He scoops up Jessica, who's now passed out from that punching, wraps her in her bed linen, and he takes her to that barn. He restrains her in there, and instead of letting her go, or killing her and putting her out of her misery, mm-hmm. right, he goes on to torture her for three full days. Jesus. Then he murders her. Jesus. At this point, I'd like to say that Jessica wasn't the only one. Stanley Dishon was raping at least three more close family members. Mm, Put him out of his misery. Due to all of the stress that this was placing on the family, he struck a plea deal. Now, we talked about plea deals in the Patreon episode Mm -hmm. about how uh, just it's a mm, double edged sword that that Mm -hmm. plea deal. Stanley Dishon would plead guilty to four counts of rape as well as the manslaughter of his sweet niece, Jessica Dishon. Because of the plea agreement, Stanley Dishon received, you ready, mm-hmm. only a 20-year sentence. No, that's, that's not, nope, not enough time. In 2019, a 60-year-old Stanley Dishon sat down for an interview with WDRB-TV, the reporter writer that conducted the interviews, were Valerie Chen and Jason Riley. We like to give credit where credit's due. They did all this work. I didn't. This part, anyway. He's at Kentucky State Penitentiary, and he sits down with them, and he says his Mm -hmm. words. 
I wanted to tell people that I am an innocent mm. man. I've been wrongfully convicted and put in prison. I did not kill Jessica Dawn Dishon. I never had nothing to do with that. Dishon says that he was at work that day before 7 a.m. the morning that Jessica was taken. Now, he said his co-workers and boss, boss's secretary could vouch for him, but since this time, 2000, he did this the winter of this year, this current year, I guess, the business has closed. It closed down in 2006. The employees that he had said he worked with could not be found for comment. Mm. Which, again, I find a little weird. But whatever. You know, okay, maybe they moved on. Well, nobody know. probably wants to be involved with him. Be involved. Mm-hmm. I would... S- what are you going to say? He's a really nice yeah. guy? He's not. Nobody's going to want to stick up for him. Stanley Dishon claims the inmates lied and there was no physical evidence or anything else tying him to the case. Interesting note here. The inmate that had given this information to Lynn Hunt was given nothing in exchange for oh, this Oh, good. So he didn't did it, get any did time it, off... Of his sentence for it? Nope. Good. Correct. And he did the right. He's not rewarded anything. He did the right thing out of his cold black heart. heart. Yeah. No, I mean. Exactly. That's. No, I know. I'm Because it's true. Right. I'm laughing because it's mm-hmm. true. I'm not laughing at the people that died. Yeah. Dishon also claimed he only pled guilty on advice of his attorneys and he didn't fully comprehend what he was doing. He said, I don't understand the law. I don't understand how the law even works. But at the time, however, he did, in fact, tell the judge he did know what he was doing. Mm. During the trial, Dishon's attorney said that they believed he did not kill Jessica. Here's where... mm, 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 mm. During the time he was facing the murder charges, he was also facing some separate charges. You ready? Of sexually abusing family members. So a judge had ruled that his past sexual assault conviction, as well as these charges, could be brought up and out in the murder trial. So with all that in mind, the attorneys are like, we're going to go for a plea agreement, even though we don't believe you killed right. her. Because knowing that, you would get life or death, right? Mm-hmm. right? And that's, it's... His attorney... I'm kind of shocked because normally the judge will say, you know, if it's not related to the case, he, you can't really bring that yeah. up, you know, like the his prior rapes. Mm-hmm. I So... His attorney at the time, Jennifer Whitmire, had said, had it just been the murder, they would have gone to trial, no problem. But due to all those cases, they were afraid that that would lean in, which I just said, and then he would get a way more harsh penalty, which he should have, by the Mm -hmm. way. By pleading guilty to those charges and manslaughter and Jessica's death, he was given 20 years with the chance for parole in 16. Mm -hmm. Did you hear Mm -hmm. me? 16. He could be paroled one year less than she lived. Yeah, that's, no. That's unexcusable. Claiming he didn't do it, of course, Dishon entered an Alford plea in court, meaning he maintained his innocence but admitted a jury had enough evidence to find him guilty. He claimed, I wanted to go to trial, but I had no help. I didn't know what to do. So he followed the advice of his attorney. He goes on to say, I was always told to keep my mouth shut and not speak out in court. They snuck around and they didn't tell me what was going on. He saying this about his attorneys and that if he had better understood it, he would have demanded to go to trial. So this is his appeal. Now, is this is, this is his appeal, right? No, no, no. This was this is when he took the part of his plea agreement. So he didn't plead guilty. He pled. He took the Alfred uh, agreement. He took an Alfred right. plea. This was his plea. Yeah. I mean, he's still in jail. When you're only doing 16 years, you're not going to appeal. I mean, he's appealing to the public via the reporter, but he's not, I mean, he's just serving his time. He doesn't. In fact, I read somewhere that the uh, Poverty Law Center, where they go in and they look at cases that they believe were the guy's right. innocent, and they turn down his, they his turn plea. down his. Yeah. His no, case. there's, there's no way he's innocent. I don't think anyway. And what I say goes, so, so there. It's okay. Yeah. That's right. That's why I said we should do this. Mm-hmm. So let's wrap up a few mm-hmm. things. The crimes have obviously caused issues in the family. Mike and Edna you know, had been divorced. They got divorced. Mike and Edna believed strongly that Stanley did murder their baby girl. And also, you know, Stanley had lived with the family when they needed it, when he mm-hmm. needed it, rather. He would live with them on and off. And I just That's how he knew mm. how everybody went to school and who left who. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I could say when your kids go to school, you know what I mean? I don't have to live with you. But if his brother, I mean, I'm sure that, you know, they were tight. They're brothers. He lived there, so he would know However, the schedule. On and off, on and off, right? He wasn't at this point. He didn't Mm -hmm. live with them. But when he needed a place to stay, he would end up living with them for a while. Now, Mike and Stanley's sister, her name's Wanda. She believes that Stanley is, in fact, innocent. To wrap this up in a nice little bow, like we 
like to do. No, we don't. There were lots of mistakes made in this initial investigation. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look, Mm -hmm. see, okay? So, number one, we have David Greenwall, who was the first detective on scene when Jessica disappeared. He said he repeatedly asked then-detective Charles Mann to come to the home after finding one of Jessica's shoes and her vehicle in disarray. Mann, who has since died, he died in 2005, refused to come to the house or the scene. He was adamant that Jessica would return home on her Mm -hmm. own. Dave Greenwall also said that he had turned over the photos and notes to another detective at the time that he had, you know, collected from the scene, and they were subsequently, what? Lost. How wealthy were there Two. these families? Did they have money? Were they Not very poor? at all. Yeah. Huh. No, no. I wonder, no. could Nuh-uh. that play a part in the whole situation, mm-hmm. you think? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let's keep going. Number two, it would be days before a detective would actually come and investigate Jessica's vehicle. And by that point, family members, neighbors, media, they've all been there. They've mm-hmm. sat in the vehicle. They've touched it. At this point, it was pointless to even investigate the vehicle. There were so many fingerprints and just trace evidence from other mm-hmm. people storming about there. And that could have been the first thing. I mean, that would have been an easy thing, mm-hmm. right? Number three, investigators also didn't interview Stanley Dishon after the murder. They didn't. Not once. Now, uh, we all know that everybody's a suspect, especially close members Mm -hmm. of a family, right? And they never talked to him after the murder of Jessica. Not really surprised. Four, DNA. Now, there's conflicting stories about if some was collected at all from anybody. Mike claimed that Stanley's DNA should have been taken in to compare with what they found on Jessica And one of the detectives said that, in fact, the investigators were not able to get a DNA swab from Jessica because her body was, you know, it was very badly decomposed when they collected it. And then what they did have of it was not refrigerated. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it rotted and they lost it all. Stanley did say uh, he did give DNA and would give DNA. But then again, you got to wonder, is he going to give DNA knowing that it can't be found to her because she... There is none to get right. from her. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? I guess what would just be like the last shocking twist, the last turn of the knife or whatever. Lynn Hunt was, you know, looking through all those boxes and deep, deep, deep within those boxes, she found yet another letter from an informant who had sent a letter to police claiming that his cellmate, who was named Stanley Dishon, admitted to the murder of his niece, Jessica. The letter was written, you ready? Uh Uh-huh. In 2002, at the exact same time, Bucky Brooks was on trial for that murder. No one followed up on it. No one. No one at all? No. They just put it in the bottom of the box. They wanted Bucky. They wanted a slam dunk case. Mm -hmm. That's what it was. They wanted to go away, right? That inmate as well was not, he wasn't promised anything for that letter. He wrote it on his own. It was unsolicited, okay? Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. They saw they had a scapegoat in Bucky. They wanted it solved because they botched up the case so badly and they were going to get Bucky and they weren't even going to look anywhere else. Exactly. Now, and here's the deal. People make mistakes, right? Wait, the, uh, you want me to wrap this up because then you're going to yeah, get, because this is, this is the doozy and this is, uh, I mean, like I said, you and I are just moms from the Midwest, but even mm-hmm. you and I would be like, hmm, that seems a little odd. All people never want to believe that those closest to you, those that you love, those that you hang right. out with on the daily, those that you, you know, go shopping at the mall with and go see movies and have Thanksgiving and dinner with, could ever trust. be capable of such of these things. But, you know, if police would have taken a better look at Stanley and followed up on this, any of this, I just don't understand how this didn't come about. So, you know, in 2002, Stanley Dishon is charged with sexually abusing two girls age 8 and 10. He later oh pleads. He later pleads guilty and is sentenced to ten years in jail. So this would be when that first letter that was his cellmate way back in two thousand and two. Mm-hmm. Okay, fast forward August twenty seventh, two thousand thirteen. Stanley Dishon is charged with sexually abusing a seven year old female, oh, a relative Lord. in his very own family, and he is charged with doing this back in you ready Ooh, mm-hmm. time warp back 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 nineteen eighty two. So he was a known abuser. November 4th, 2013, Stanley Dishon pleads not guilty to sodomizing a female relative between 1982 and 1987. 
January 24, 2014, Stanley Dishon pleads not guilty to sexually abusing a male relative between 1996 and 1997. Mm-hmm. So even after Stanley was charged in these crimes, police didn't think, hey, you know, he kind of likes little kids and Jessica was young and they grew up together. Maybe we should take a look, you know, maybe Mm -hmm. we should, uh, you know, look. and they didn't. I I just I don't you know, people that commit acts like this against a child are capable of anything. I mean, if you can rape a seven year old, you can kill a 17 year old. Like what's to them? They're evil. They're, you know, no, it's ridiculous. I would have. One of, one if, of the things I read I was uh, after Edna and Mike, divor- they haven't even spoke to each other. Yeah, it's it would be so. very difficult on a marriage. Yeah. And again, I mean, it's pretty difficult when your child dies anyway. Marriage is yeah. difficult, period. But if your child dies, it's so your I mean, chances yeah. of divorces go up. Then if it's a violent murder, I'm sure it's higher. And then if one of your spouse's siblings is responsible, I'm sure that there's no forgiveness there whatsoever. For anybody on that side of the family. Oh, I would too. I'd totally be in jail. I think I would lose it. I think my mind would. Well, I think I'd lost it anyway. But I think that I just don't think I would become so consumed with hate. And I know you're supposed Mm -hmm. to forgive them and all that. But I just, uh uh-uh. No. And then the fact that it's your sibling. Are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. You, uh, it's almost like sending your poor daughter into the hands of a predator. It's terrible. And it's not their fault if they didn't know. But. Also, I don't know if my sibling had been doing this to people, right? And it was first came out in 2002. Wouldn't you be like, hey, wait a minute. I'm not victim blaming at all because it would be a hard time coming out to say your dad molested you or raped Mm -hmm. you or any of that. Mm -hmm. But just think if the girls could have come forward, Mm -hmm. this all would have. Well, he would have probably killed them and threw them in the river bottom. And that'd be it. We wouldn't be reading about this right now. Well, we'd be. Reading about those poor two girls. Yeah. But anyway, just horrible. That's my story, Jen. For that's everybody it. involved, it's, it's just horrible. It really is. Well, People are just, sometimes, you know what, there's such good in the world, and then sometimes there's just darkness. Well, I mean, and you know, I don't even. The whole police thing, people make mistakes. Every day to day, people make mistakes, but at least fucking try. You know what I'm saying? There's no right? reason why that police officer should have gone out there without gloves. There's no reason why a chief of police or somebody should automatically just assume that the child has run away. I would right. like to see statistics on how many people are actually. Well, I mean, I, I think never it said, No, it does. But I would like to see how many people that actually have never run away or thought they were people thought they were going to run away and see how many actually have. Does that make sense to yeah, you? Yeah, totally. Well, I think that more often than not, they do run away. I hope. I mean, I hope that there's not that many brutal slayings out there of kids. I think a lot of times kids are, they're rotten. Believe me. We know. Oh, no. I know that they're rotten. But if, like, I would be totally shocked if one of my kids ran away. And I think you would be totally shocked if one of your kids ran away. Like, I would, to the day I die, would say, there's no way they ran away. They were taken. right? Right? They've never gotten in trouble with the police yet. They're still young. There's still hope that they will. Mm -hmm. (laughs) At least my younger Mm -hmm. one, I know they will be. We're saving bond money for her (laughs) or bail money. But um, just out of all those who have never gotten into any trouble, not have have ever caused Mm -hmm. their parents any strife, how many of those have actually ran away? Well, that, and that's what I think, like, as a parent, you know, so say your kid starts acting out. I hate you. They're slamming doors. They're doing drugs. They're sneaking out at night. So then if a police officer would say, do you think they ran away? You could be, you would say, you know, it's a possibility versus a kid that comes home after school, does homework, has never done a drug, doesn't go out and party, plays video games all the time. Like they're Mm -hmm. home under your roof. You know what they're doing. They're not going to run away. There's no way. Like, you know that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think you know that. But then again, I guess we all, as parents, we all think we know our kids, right? Yeah, true. I don't know. I don't know, but it just, it irks Terrible. Anyway. Terrible. That was a very interesting, good twist. Couple of, of them in there, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it, and it was actually, I was surprised all four or five times I've heard it. So I know. It's amazing, right? You did a good amazing. job, too. That that one Did person I? that gave us a bad review about our bad acting. Our acting. They, I'm taking they should acting take a classes listen to this. now. I know. They, I'm they, taking acting classes now. You're doing great. I can tell. Mm-hmm. That, that, all that pod money that we're, we're making, that windfall, ooh, mm-hmm. 
It's paying off Listen those to this. lessons. Hawk, I hear the cannons roar. <laughs> Is so it the king up. approaching? <laughs> All right. Well, uh, guess what? Hey, remember, lock your doors. And keep passing by those open windows. Uh, bye-bye. Love ya. Today's episode was researched and written by me, Cam. For more information about this episode, as well as all the sources I used, please check out our show notes or the podcast website at ourtruecrimepodcast.com. Our True Crime Podcast is developed and created by host Jen and Cam. Original music and audio mix of all our True Crime Podcast episodes is courtesy of Nico Vertese from We Talk of Dreams. Listener discretion is provided by Edward October from October Pod VHS. Our True Crime Podcast is executive produced by Nico Vertese and Dick Bain. Make sure to like and subscribe to Our True Crime Podcast wherever you listen to your podcast. We can be reached on Instagram and Facebook at Our True Crime Podcast or on Twitter at Our True Crime Pod. You can email us at Our True Crime Podcast at gmail.com. If you really like the show, make sure to check out our Patreon at Our True Crime Podcast. Our True Crime Podcast is an OTC production. Now, Bullet County, that area is located just south of Louisville, if you guys know where that is. Louisville. You have to say Louisville. Like Nashville. Louisville. Louisville. Louis, no, there's no Ville. It's a Vol. Louisville. Louisville. Nashville. So you say it without opening your mouth. Louisville. It's, like it rhymes Nash- with mm-hmm. It rhymes with full. Yeah. Nash full. Louisville. Yeah. Uh, that's that's kind of like Steelville. So you can say Steelville or you can say Stillville, depending on which way you want to go. But I'm it's still okay, Ville. getting back to this. Yeah. Are you pretending like you don't know what's up? I am pretending like I don't know what's okay. up. I went, I'm ready to I also, be shocked. I also have to ask you that every once in a while just to make sure we're good. You know what I'm saying? Like oh, it's recording like my phone doesn't lose you. Yeah. And yeah. Where my phone didn't go dead or the spirits yeah. of whomever it's a ghost, I'm telling you I know I don't know like I said it's before a- it's my magnetic personality it makes everything just go to shit that's true my dog is growling outside oh. she never does that that's what the that's, that's what the guy suggested that the dog is growling outside yeah the dog growls outside boy that- my dog can hear me and I guess because I'm not usually home at this time I don't know sorry we're only on page one too are you outside out his is no it- she outside your door She's, or outside in the outside world? No, outside my door. Like oh, okay. Right here, like next to me. Yeah. yeah. Reggie was afraid to come down the steps for some reason today. I don't know why. It's because that ghost, it's still with it's, you. Maybe. The I don't know. Goats. I'm Could telling be, you, it is. I think it's just he's too fat and he's scared he's going to fall down the stairs. That's personally <laughs> why I think. Do you really think that's it? I have no idea. But for some reason, he would not come downstairs. And I have learned that if you sit... Like a laundry basket or something right in front of the stairs. He will not go around it to go downstairs. He'll just like sit and whine because he doesn't know Reggie's how to get through. Reggie's my spirit through. animal. Mm-hmm. Gypsies As they get closer. Gypsies she was a witch. <clears throat> immediately. I keep saying immediately. I need a new word. Suddenly. <laughs> it strikes Last her. Summer. Yeah. Sudden. Suddenly. Okay, stay with me, Jen. Stay with me. We're on page seven. We got to go to page nine. Woo-hoo. We can do it. <clears throat>